In a deeply emotional interview with Tucker Carlson, Steve Bannon laid bare his thoughts on his prosecution, portraying it as an extension of his lifelong dedication to the nation. Reflecting on his days serving on a Navy destroyer in his 20s, Bannon expressed a poignant readiness to become a political prisoner in his 70s. He fiercely condemned the legal system for targeting him with what he insists is a trivial misdemeanor, unprecedented in its severity. His voice trembled with indignation as he questioned the fairness of the January 6th committee, highlighting critical issues of executive privilege and the committee's legitimacy. Don't miss, why does Steve Bannon compare his potential prison sentence to his military service? What are the main legal arguments Bannon plans to take to the Supreme Court? Why does Bannon believe the January 6th committee's structure is illegitimate? Well, and I won't even, I think that's all very well known. I just wanted to make certain that people understood precisely what's going on, which is you are being prosecuted. You were prosecuted. You are being prosecuted. You were prosecuted. Now you're being persecuted for your politics. Imagine the sting of being unfairly judged, the isolation of feeling persecuted for your beliefs. It's a shared struggle, a collective awareness of political oppression that binds us. I deeply empathize with the pain of being marginalized because of one's political stance. There is a pervasive conservative fear, a gnawing worry about the bias and inequity within our judicial system. Now you're being persecuted for your politics. But first, a personal question. I just read this morning um, you saying you're fine with it. You're not afraid. I just read this morning you saying you're fine with it. You're not afraid. In the face of adversity, the courage and steadfastness of individuals shine brilliantly. To stand resolute, embracing the conservative values of courage and resilience is truly commendable. I deeply admire and respect those who remain unwavering in the midst of tremendous challenges. For most people, going to prison is the scariest possible thing that could happen. That's why it's a punishment. For most people, going to prison is the scariest possible thing that could happen. That's why it's a punishment. Understanding the deep fear and gravity of imprisonment while recognizing the profound anxiety humans feel, it's crucial to connect with the audience. This also sets the stage to highlight the remarkable bravery of the character. Um, how do you feel about it? And why are you calm? How do you feel about it? And why are you calm? It delves deep into the intricacies of someone's psyche, fostering a profound sense of empathy and sparking curiosity about their emotional landscape. Honor their calm demeanor while striving to grasp the origin of their inner strength. I spent in my 20s, I spent, uh, what, almost four years on a Navy destroyer in the uh, North Arabian Sea, Persian Gulf, Western Pacific, South China Sea. I spent in my 20s, I spent, oh, what, almost four years on a Navy destroyer in the North Arabian Sea, Persian Gulf, Western Pacific, South China Sea. A heart brimming with respect and deep appreciation for those who serve in the military is a cornerstone of our community's values. This profound experience underscores a lifelong dedication to our nation, highlighting the readiness of individuals to face any challenge with unwavering resolve. So in my 20s, I uh, served my country on a Navy destroyer. And in my 70s, I'll serve my country in a federal prison. It doesn't make any difference. It won't change my life one way. I don't have a big social agenda. I'm dedicated to this work of saving my country. I'm dedicated to this work of saving my country, embodied in the spirit of patriotism and unwavering dedication to national service our conservative values. These ideals elevate individuals as selfless patriots, tirelessly working to propel our nation forward. And if, uh, if I have to be a political prisoner, I'll... if I have to be a political prisoner, I'll be a political prisoner. At its core, this conservative ideal champions the courage to face personal trials for a greater purpose. It's about embracing the sacrifices demanded by unwavering commitment, dedication, and deeply held principles. Be a political person. The one, just a couple of things of what you said in the open. Remember, these, this is a misdemeanor. Remember, this is a misdemeanor. The injustice faced by individuals due to the glaring imbalance in punishment is heart-wrenching. The legal system's harsh responses highlight deep concerns about fairness and reveal an unsettling political bias. When we're, we were in the federal courthouse, the, the guy that ran the federal courthouse said, as, and this is in D.C., he said, and I think he'd been there 30 or 40 years, he told one of my guys he had never remembered a misdemeanor ever being prosecuted. He says they're so backed up with felonies, and that's why half the felon, three-quarters of felonies get settled out of court. They just don't, there's no time. He said he's never seen a misdemeanor ever gone to trial. Uh, particularly Im immediately, they remember this is a criminal charge, not civil. You could charge somebody civilly, and uh, and and like a Peter Navarro, 
my uh, my colleague and brother, he's down in a federal prison in uh, in Miami. I don't know if they've ever had a misdemeanor folk, if someone there. And Peter's the same way. It's it's a misdemeanor. So they did this. Remember, President Trump invoked executive privilege, sent my lawyer a letter on advice of counsel. My lawyer told me flat out uh, executive privilege has been uh, had been exerted. So just you just stand down. My lawyer told me flat out executive privilege had been exerted. So you just stand down. Trust in legal counsel is paramount. There's a strong belief that the correct legal steps should be respected. Yet there's an overwhelming frustration when individuals who depend on expert advice end up facing penalties despite adhering to legal protocols. And uh, he would handle that. Uh, and we had three things that we argued in the, in the court, the three things are up on appeal still back at the D.C. Circuit, maybe on bank, maybe to the Supreme Court, which my lawyers are figuring out here in the next couple of days. But it's not just exertion of executive privilege in the lack of only or depending on my counsel, because my counsel was absolutely adamant that it had been exerted and uh, and I couldn't respond even if I wanted to. It's also the structure of the committee. The difference in Holder is that and you see now in watching this kind of firestorm over the last couple of days, it's the very structure of Pelosi's committee because in, in Watergate and Iran Contra, you had these committees set up and you had a ranking member and you had minority counsel. And, and that causes the tension and drama in these committees. The, the, the a minority counsel gets all the testimony, you get all the evidence, and you can do cross-examination. That's one of the reasons, Tucker, I think even with the ABC TV producer that came in, the January 6th thing kind of flopped because Cassidy Hutchinson couldn't be, you know, Nancy Pelosi, when Jim Banks, the great Jim Banks and, and, and Jim Jordan were the two that were supposed to be on there. And Nancy Pelosi told, told McCarthy no. And Kevin, for whatever reason, just agreed to that. And that's why they never had a committee. You just had you had crying Kinzinger and you had Cheney, who have both been outed from Congress, were the Republicans. Everybody else, there was no ranking member. As soon as she saw Jim Banks' name, who will soon be in the U.S. Senate from Indiana, and Jim Jordan, who's head of judiciary, she just told him no. And for whatever strategic reason they made, they went along with it. So the other challenge I've got is the very structure of the committee, which the trial judge kind of struggled with. So I believe that has to go to the Supreme Court. You know, also, I'm prepared to because I pay all my legal bills. I've never asked anybody to pay, you know, set up a legal fund. I pay all my bills, but I'm prepared. And I've told my team, regardless of what it costs, I'm prepared to go to the Supreme Court. I'm prepared. And I've told my team, regardless of what it costs, I'm prepared to go to the Supreme Court. He speaks with a voice rooted in conservative values, fiercely defending his rights with unwavering resolve. His words radiate a deep-seated commitment to justice, showcasing his relentless pursuit of the highest legal standards to uphold his principles and confront injustice head-on. On the executive privilege, on Lacavola, and on the structure of the committee, which I think maybe of all the issues, because the defense of counsel is a technical thing for the lawyers that needs to be solved in this circuit, the two most important are, are, are executive privilege but the most important to me still is the structure of this committee. Was it a legitimate committee? And you see with the videos you got the last couple of days of Nancy Pelosi saying, you know, it was her responsibility to the National Guard. This is why we need a complete and thorough investigation uh, by the House into the January 6th committee. Exactly what went on. You know, was it a Fed's erection? Was it not a Fed's erection? What are the details? And what did the January 6th committee know about it? Because, we've, you know, if you follow Darren Beatty. In Revolver News every day, it's another – every couple of days you get information that was suppressed uh, from the committee as John Solomon and these investigative reporters keep breaking. So I think there will be a lot more of this. But July 1st, hey, I served my country on a Navy ship. I'll serve my country as a political prisoner uh, in a federal prison for a misdemeanor. It doesn't – I don't bat one eye. Uh, whatever, but, it, whatever it takes to win this revolution, we got to do. But you're – you did. During a recent interview with Tucker Carlson, Steve Bannon opened up about his legal struggles, passionately asserting that he's being targeted for his political convictions. Despite the looming threat of imprisonment, Bannon remained composed, likening his ordeal to his steadfast service in the Navy. He conveyed an unwavering dedication to his cause, no matter the repercussions. Bannon drew attention to the oddity of his prosecution for a misdemeanor, noting that such cases rarely proceed to trial, given the backlog of serious felonies. He argued that his prosecution is extraordinary, especially since misdemeanors typically get resolved out of court. Bannon also delved into the invocation of executive privilege by President Trump, which his lawyers advised him to uphold. This guidance, along with other legal arguments, forms the crux of Bannon's appeal, which might escalate to the Supreme Court. He emphasized that his legal team is determined to contest the committee that prosecuted him, likening it to past committees such as Watergate and Iran-Contra, 
which included bipartisan members to ensure fairness and transparency. Moreover, Bannon lambasted the January 6 committee for its lack of bipartisan representation and transparency, suggesting that vital information was withheld. He called for a comprehensive investigation into the committee's actions and decisions, insisting that its structure and operations were fundamentally flawed. Despite these hurdles, Bannon stands firm in his political mission, viewing potential imprisonment as another act of service to his country. He highlighted his resolve to fight his legal battles to the highest court, driven by a conviction in the righteousness of his cause and the necessity of his actions in what he describes as a revolution. Steve Bannon's tone is resolute and unwavering, showcasing his deep commitment to his cause. He is prepared to endure imprisonment to maintain his pride in his past military service and his faith. His statement exudes a sense of duty and sacrifice, portraying the possibility of imprisonment as a continuation of his service to the country, not as a defeat. Tucker Carlson's role is to depict Steve Bannon's situation as an unjust political persecution. This framing creates a sense of urgency and solidarity among like-minded viewers, highlighting the high stakes of the political battle they are fighting. Steve Bannon's calm acceptance of his fate and his detailed criticism of the legal process reflect a man who feels deeply wronged but remains steadfast in his mission. His determination is emotionally powerful, portraying himself as a committed warrior for a cause, willing to face any difficulties and mobilize his supporters. Steve Bannon's personal responsibility and sincerity are evident. His willingness to serve time in federal prison for his political beliefs and actions underscores his commitment to his principles, no matter the consequences. His patriotism is clear as he shows readiness to serve both in the Navy and as a political prisoner, driven by a deep sense of duty and sacrifice for his country. This resonates with conservative values, respecting military service, and enduring personal hardship for the greater good. Criticism of the legal and political institutions involved in Steve Bannon's prosecution is central to his message. He questions the legality and structure of the January 6 committee and the fairness of his misdemeanor prosecution. This aligns with broader concerns about potential bias and injustice in government and legal proceedings, emphasizing the need for transparency and accountability. Steve Bannon's actions invite reflection on the moral and ethical implications of his willingness to face imprisonment. Even with personal sacrifices, his stance embodies the ethical responsibility of defending his beliefs. It is seen as a moral choice to uphold his interpretation of justice and freedom, regardless of the personal cost. What do you think?